Welcome to Catalyzing Change Week. This year's Catalyzing Change Week is about solutions from the front lines by social innovators. In 2022, Catalyst 2030 concentrated its efforts on bringing proximate leaders and frontline solutions to the forefront. Collaborations led by members from the Global South produced groundbreaking reports on climate and transforming education with an emphasis on offering local solutions. We continued our mission to create an enabling environment for social entrepreneurs to flourish by initiating a letter to donors signed by more than 1,200 social entrepreneurs and innovators. The Catalyst 2030 award ceremony was spectacular and the awards themselves welcomed by the private sector, governments, buyer multilaterals and donors. Catalyst 2030 as a movement is disruptive. One of the best things I think that's come out of Catalyst 2030 so far um, is incredible collaboration across the ecosystem that just didn't exist before Catalyst came into being. The thing I love most about Catalyst is that it's an open movement for social entrepreneurs around the world. I'd encourage anyone who's uh, looking to be more connected with their local communities around social development goals to come along to Catalyze and Change Week. Welcome to Catalyzing Change Week. So, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we'll begin. My name is Sunita Menon, and I represent Breakthrough. Uh, we are a rights-based organization working to end violence against women and girls. And uh, we do that by changing the gender norms around us. I had strategic partnerships and scale up in the organization, and I'm currently scaling a gender transformative school system uh, in Odisha and Punjab government schools um, with a potential reach of 4 million adolescents and 66,000 teachers. Uh, before we get into uh, the details of the uh, program, uh, there are some housekeeping rules. Ellen, if you want to share them, I think uh, that'll be nice. <laughs> then we can head straight into the panel. Yes, of course. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we have a few housekeeping rules to please keep your video on if you can. Um, show your name and your company. You're very welcome to share these in chat as well, as well as where in the world you are connecting from today. Um, if you have any questions, you are very welcome to ask those in the chat and we will get to them when we can. So thank you for joining us and we will go ahead and get started. Thank you, Aline. So uh, today's topic of discussion is equitable education systems, critical insights, and collective action. Uh, this panel is co-hosted by Adhya and Quality Education Services and Breakthrough. I'll be moderating the discussion, and we'll be joined by an incredible array of speakers from India, uh, US, and Africa who have come together for the Catalyzing Change Week 2023. Uh, we'll be talking about how can we be cognizant about the way gender systems intersect with other forms of discrimination such as class race caste identity and impact the lives of adolescents how can gender responsive education systems help adolescents reach their full potentials and you know achieve their aspirations so through this panel we'll be presenting solutions from the front lines people would be talking about their experiences some data evidence programs which have worked, which will help us accelerate the impact of sustainable development goals. So uh, our panelists include, um, to give a global South perspective on the issue, we have with us Deepak Nakar, who will be joining the uh, session a little late as he's in Boston and uh, you know it's middle of the night for him. <laughs> But I'll anyway introduce him and then we can um, take it on from there. Uh, Deepak Nakar is the co founder of Raising Voices. It's a nonprofit organization based in Uganda to prevent violence against women and violence against children. He's the CEO of, of the Coalition of Good Schools, which brings voices from the global south. Now, Deepak has been one of the leading voices advocating on prevention of violence against children in schools. At Raising Voices, he had steered a creation and evaluation and scale up of Good Schools Toolkit, which has reached over 1,000 
schools and we'll be hearing about his experiences from running the coalition to leading uh, raising voices uh, to provide a government perspective we have with us uh, uh, mr rajpal singh who's the district education officer from haryana uh, he's been an active supporter of breakthroughs gender equity program in haryana government schools so thank you rajpal ji for joining us uh, from adhya quality education services we have neeta luthria who's worked in senior leadership positions in an international school she's a trustee of kim pro foundation an organization committed to recognizing excellence in business healthcare education and environment she also serves as a board member at Down to Earth, a grassroots organization in Mumbai. As a lead assessor, she's taken part in several school reviews all over the country, and she'll bring in her experience into this discussion. We also have with us Rose Gastler, who's the education director, of the UWA School Ranchi. Uh, originally from the US, um, Rose joined UWA in 2012 while studying the use of sports to empower disadvantaged girls. Um, after spending months with Yuva's young female coaches in Dharavi slums in Mumbai, she moved to Yuva's base in rural Jharkhand, uh, where it is really, it's a, it's a tough place to work and uh, the discrimination against girls are like at the peak, the early marriages and a whole lot of other issues that girls out there face. Now, Rose coordinated Yuva's education program for two years before founding the Yuva school in 2015, and she acted as the school principal from 2015 to 2021. Welcome, Rose. Uh, Thank you. We, we also have Lee Krishnan, who is an educator with over 37 years of teaching experience at school and college level. And uh, 32 years uh, she spent in Diamond Jubilee High School, Mumbai, uh, where she'll be, uh, today she'll be talking from the school perspective around what works. The overall session is for 90 minutes. Um, the panelists will take some key questions. And the participants who are joining us, thank you. Thank you very much for joining uh, the discussion. We encourage you to write your questions, remarks, comments on the chat. Um, the panelists are welcome to answer the questions as we proceed. Um, if, if there are any questions, queries left, then we will take it at the end of the session. Um, we can spend the last 15 minutes uh, to answer the questions which are pending. So um, we're ready to roll now. <laughs> So um, I think uh, on this entire question, we would really like to know from all the panelists. I mean, if you can give like quick opening remarks, because you all work in the education sector, you've all worked in schools. You know, you've uh, we have people who have directly worked in schools. We have people who represent the government. We have people who run coalitions at a global uh, South level. So from your perspective, what is your definition of good schools? What are good schools? And uh, especially when you look at the identity of the students and students having multiple intersectional identities within the schooling system. So how and what a good school, uh, you know, your definition of it and how does it become inclusive for students with different identities? So um, Rose, maybe we can start with you and then we can go to Nita. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Sunita. Uh, so before I answer, I'll, I'll just give a little context about my school, UWA school, um, before answering the question. So as Sunita mentioned, we are an NGO school. We're quite small, only about 100 students, but all of our students are uh, from very low income families in rural Charkhand. Uh, most of them are first generation learners, many of their parents are illiterate or only received a primary level of education, and it is an all girls school. Um, and so within that context and having led that school for seven years, I believe a, a good school is a place where students feel safe, primarily when they walk in they feel safe, and they feel included, and they feel like this is my space. You know, it should feel the feeling should be like a second home and then it should become a place where every single student gains the tools that they need to reach their full potential academically and personally, whatever that may be. Um, and that would be my definition of a, a good school. I could speak. I could speak longer, but I want to give the other panelists a chance. But that's my my idea of good school. Sure. Thanks, Rose. Um, yeah, schools need to be safe and 
if schools aren't providing the potent, you know, space where children can reach their full potential and, you know, aspire for things and have it have ownership of their own lives and are able to take key decisions around, you know, core aspects, it's really <laughs> not worth it. Um, Nita, if you can, if we can hear from you on your definition of good schools. Um, and also give a little more background because I've just given like a really short brief. So yeah. it'll be nice to hear from you. Yeah. So my journey has been from working in a very elite private school to now working with um, government schools across the country, especially uh, a lot of our work is in the Northeast and in yeah. states where, um, you know, uh, they are realizing that children going to government schools are being deprived of even the basics of education in some cases because um, because of this nebulous quality of what is a good school. And actually, I mean, just to put in a plug for Adhyayan, that is our tagline, a good mm -hmm. school for every child. Mm -hmm. um, and when we talk about good schools, very much like what Rose was saying, definitely safe places for all children, um, and particularly for children who come from uh, backgrounds maybe where even childhood is not being honored because so many of them are forced in, you know, there was this really poignant photograph the other day on one of our groups where uh, there was this little kid, he couldn't have been more than four or five himself, and uh, he had on his back a, a little baby uh, sibling uh, and that's how this child attends school I mean the responsibility of looking after someone who needs to be looked after to look after another one so uh, yeah uh, a good school I think would the, the more I work with schools I, I sometimes really wonder whether schools are really any more places for children even even bigger schools you know because this whole idea of boxing children into rooms and, uh, you know, in, children are meant to be outside. They're meant to have freedom to play, to discover, to explore. But yeah. so many schools think of themselves as these places where children need to be disciplined and they need to follow a schedule and they need to go from one subject to another. And so much focus is given just on academic achievement. I think a lot of schools are actually the antithesis of what a good school should be. And um, I would say a good school is where really the student feels honored. It, it, they shouldn't even be called students. I mean, because students have the word. Learners should feel honored and comfortable and have the opportunity to explore whether it's their identity, whether it's their interests, their hobbies, whatever. So, yeah. Thank Thanks, you. Nita. Thanks, Neeta. Um, uh, Lee, if you can um, come with your uh, definition and also speak a little bit about yourself. Okay, so as the introduction says, I've been in education for 37 plus years, became a teacher purely by accident, never intended to be a teacher. I got into teaching and never looked back, discarded all the other dreams. I tried lecturing but discovered my real joy was teaching high school students. So then I did a B.A. and went back to school. And I've done the entire spectrum because I've taught in an all boys school. Then I lectured in Sapphire College, Mumbai, which is an all girls college. Mm -hmm. And then I went back to, I joined Diamond Jubilee High School. And it, when I started off, it was a boys school, then it became co-educational. So I come from that perspective. Okay, yeah. so it was an adjustment for us because we had very few girls in the classroom initially and then, you know, uh, take, uh, making sure that they felt they could be heard and they felt safe and all that goes along with co-educational institutions. Mm -hmm. I also come from a background where I personally have challenged gender stereotypes right mm -hmm. from the time I was a little kid where I did not believe that... Uh, little girl should be seen and not heard or little girl shouldn't climb trees. So yeah. I carried that lesson back with me into the classroom. And to come to your question about schools, a school, a good school for me is one in which every child is excited about going to school every single day. A child who's 
who wants to be in school and who reaches out and sends occasionally a message saying, I'm missing school during the holidays. I wish school was open, a child who's happy in school, who feels safe enough to share his or her own perspective without worrying about being judged. Yes, that would be an amazing school for me. Thanks, uh, Ali. I think, I mean, um, as is for work, I think it's the same stance true for education and schools also when, you know, you're excited about going to school every Monday. I think that says a lot about, uh, you know, the, the spaces that the good school provides. Uh, now, let's hear from Rajpal Ji, who is a district education officer in Haryana. He's been an active supporter of Breakthrough and uh, Breakthrough's gender equity program in schools. So, sir, we'd like to know from a government's perspective, um, since you represent the government, uh, that what is a good school? Namaskar. Namaskar. Uh, introduction. I'm uh, Rajpal, District Education Officer, Karnal Haryan. I'm hmm. a good school. How should it be? And how is the government working on it? उसके बारे में दो तीन चार बातें आप लोगों के साथ साझा करना चाहूंगा हरियाणा यदि इंडिया पर्सपेक्टिव से देखें तो एक प्रकार से यह है कि गर्ल्स एजुकेशन शायद हम उतना अच्छे से हरियाणा में नहीं करते थे परंतु यदि आज मैं बात करूं कि गुड स्कूल उसको कहेंगे जहां पर कोई भेदभाव ना लड़के में हो ना लड़की में हो एक बच्चा हमारे पास आए और उसको हम वो ऐसा एटमॉस्फेयर दें कि वो अच्छे से अपना है ना वहां पर पढ़ सके और आगे बढ़ सके उसका जीवन के सीखने का जो पर्सपेक्टिव है उसको वो सीखे उस विषय में यदि हम बात करें तो हमारे यहां जेंडर सेंसिटाइजेशन के नाम पर हम अनेक प्रकार के कार्य करते हैं हमें जो गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया का एक पर्सपेक्टिव आया था बेटी बचाओ बेटी बढ़ाओ जो हरियाणा से ही शुरू हुआ था उस के अंतर्गत भी सबसे पहले हमने यह इंश्योर किया है हरियाणा में कि हमारी कोई भी लड़की ड्रॉप आउट हां हरियाणा की हर बच्ची वो स्कूल के अंदर आए उसके हुँ. लिए शिक्षा विभाग ने अपने स्तर पर भी और एनजीओस जैसे ब्रेक थ्रू एक एग्जांपल हो सकता है उनके थ्रू भी हमने गांव-गांव हर गली मोहल्ले तक यह अप्रोच की है कि कोई भी बच्ची आउट ऑफ स्कूल ना हो और यदि स्कूल आती है तो फिर वो ड्रॉप आउट ना हो ये कार्यक्रम हरियाणा में हर साल चलता है इवन जो माइग्रेंट लोग कहीं दूसरी जगह से आते हैं उनके बच्चों को भी हम अपने स्कूलों में दाखिल करते हैं और उनको शिक्षा का एक है ना प्रॉपर मंच मुहैया कराते हैं चाहे वो है ना किसी भी एज ग्रुप का बच्चा हमारे पास आता है राइट right, सर हम आपके इनिशिएटिव्स के बारे में और बात करेंगे क्योंकि कई सारे सवाल हैं तो अलग-अलग स्तर पर ये निकल कर आएंगे मैं जल्दी से ट्रांसलेट कर लेती हूं क्योंकि कई सारे हमारे इंटरनेशनल ऑडियंस हैं जिन्हें शायद हिंदी ना समझ में आए तो जस्ट टू गिव यू अ क्विक ट्रांसलेशन ऑफ व्हाट मिस्टर राजपाल जी हु रिप्रेजेंट्स द हरियाणा एजुकेशन डिपार्टमेंट हैज मेंशनड इज दैट हरियाणा वन ऑफ द इंडियन स्टेट्स हैड you know, extremely skewed sex ratio, there was a lot of wide scale discrimination, it's a tough state to work. But despite that, uh, the government has taken a lot of initiative in ensuring um, that there is, the schools provide a space where there is no discrimination, uh, where an enabling environment is created where every child can uh, reach their full potential. Uh, the government has initiated a lot of gender sensitization activities as part of Beti Bachao, Beti Padao, which is a policy initiated by the central government. And they have uh, focused on two aspects, which is increasing enrollment in schools, making sure that there's no child uh, who is deprived of education. And once the child is in the education system, then at least um, uh, there is no dropout. So uh, they have been actively working on this. Um, uh, Rajpal ji wants to share a lot more, but as we proceed uh, with the conversation, I think we can touch upon those aspects as well. Um, uh, I mean, we all know, I mean, you, you've already touched upon the intersection of gender and ed education. And we all know that if you're able to work uh, on this intersection, we'll actually be able to impact over 17 other SDGs. But it's a really challenging uh, area. It's not easy to work at this intersection. So um, I just want to know from all of you is that from your experience of working on the ground, what have been the key challenges and gaps in our 
education system within the context of uh, gender equity. So from a school level perspective, if we can hear from you, uh, Lee, then we can go to Rose and then Neeta. Okay, so uh, the first is to change the mindset of the adults in the school. That is the greatest challenge. Yeah. So you have people telling the girls that you should behave in a certain way. You need to dress in a particular way. You can't play uh, in this way. You're a girl. And why are you raising your voice and that kind of stuff? Okay. Mm. And no matter how much the school does in mm. terms of giving you gender neutral uniforms, it's like our school did. Mm -hmm. gender neutral uh, gender neutral uniform so everybody wore trousers and a shirt the difference was in the tie but uh, everybody had the same uniforms right down to their socks and shoes we had captains of both genders but mm -hmm. at the end of it all if all the teachers are not on the same page mm -hmm. it defeats its purpose so in my class for example i might have a, a I remember a girl stood up and complained about a boy who was trying to touch her inappropriately with his elbow. And mm. she felt empowered enough to stand up and say, Miss, I uh, tell this guy to behave himself. And she said it yeah. in front of a whole class. Mm. Another teacher heard of the incident and said, why did you have to speak in public? Imagine. And I was hopping mad. Mm. That is, that's so, you know, not done right so it's stuff like that so the most important thing is changing the mindset of all the adults who come into contact with the kids mm -hmm. and letting them be themselves mm -hmm. so in my classroom if i had to move furniture around everybody had to do it it didn't matter whether you were a boy or a girl mm -hmm. if i had groups i had mixed groups if somebody wanted to sit with someone of the opposite gender it was fine you either behave or you get punished both of you yeah if you misbehave my boys were very happy because the punishment for the same crime was administered to both genders yeah. so they would be uh, they would tell me you know miss lee you're the only one who punishes the girls as well nobody else punishes them and the girls surprisingly i initially thought they you know nobody else was giving them those uh, punishments of uh, staying back after school completing work just as we did with the boys but the girls were happy to be treated on the same platform, uh, you know, on the same level as the guys. It's like, this is what we want. So mm -hmm. if they were playing ops and bats during the break. Mm -hmm. If it was a girl whacking a boy, it was fine because that was the game. <laughs> and they play, you know, ops and bats, right? Everybody played it. Yeah. Oh, and uh, I stopped a girl once and said, why did you, uh, I stopped a guy once, one of the boys and said, why did you hit that girl? And he mm -hmm. said, we're playing ops and bats. And I was like, okay. And she was fine with it. She's like, I'm going to hit him harder. But <laughs> this kind of stuff where they actually get treated like equals. Yeah. Starts from the way we adults who come in contact with them. Every day. And that's mm -hmm. the greatest challenge that I face. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a very critical issue that you've raised that because a lot of programs are designed for adolescents and young people. And, you know, you empower adolescents to speak up, to take action, to, and if the adults are not ready, if the teachers are not ready, if the parents are not ready, there's, there can be a backlash like that girl faced when she spoke up. Um, and also, I think you spoke about how, you know, there's no discrimination between boys and girls, they're treated equally, they're given equal opportunities in terms of games, activities, punishment. <laughs> and I just remembered one interesting um, study which was done, uh, even in our area of intervention, where in UP it was found that even the levels of pun punishment is varied for boys and girls. So uh, while boys receive a very, you know, hardcore physical corporal punishment, uh, girls face a lot more, uh, you know, uh, verbal abuse as well as sexual violence. So um, that's a trend and there's there are lo lots of studies which have uh, validated the same. Um, taking on from there, if you can go uh, with Rose, so if you can hear from you. Yeah, absolutely. So you might have seen me. Uh... Deepak is here. Okay. Sorry, sorry, Rose. Oh, no problem. No problem. Wonderful. Welcome, Deepak. Thank you for taking time out in the middle of the night. <laughs> really, it's so it really means a lot about your commitment to the SDG <laughs> goals and Catalyst 2030. Thank you. Thank you so much. I've already done your introduction, so we'll just um, uh, proceed uh, with, uh, we were talking about the challenges uh, 
within the education system uh, around gender-based issues. So mm -hmm. yeah, over to you, Rose. Yeah, sure. Hi, Deepak. Uh, so you may have seen me nodding my head vigorously when Lee was speaking. I was, those were almost verbatim the same notes that I had written down in response to this question that the biggest challenge in our context, but I think it's it's pretty common, is the adult mindset. Uh, our, our program, our school actually began as a girls football program in rural Jharkhand, and the level of interest from the girls right from the beginning was incredible, even though in this area, football is considered a boys sport. The very first day girls were invited to come to the field, more than 100 showed up. And uh, and it's just been the theme, you know, for, for years throughout our organization, there is so much hunger, there is so much enthusiasm on the part of the girls to try new things, to do something different, even though they've been raised uh, basically as servants within their own families. They're, they're taught from a very young age that their role within the family is to serve others. Their role is to prepare for a future role as a wife and a mother. And uh, we've seen that in order for our students to truly succeed as they move forward in their education, we have to work with their parents. We have to work with their families. And in this area, um, which, is, which is a village, parents believe that a girl's education is a waste of money. If you're going to invest money in it, it's basically like you know throwing it into the trash because they don't think that it's possible that their daughter could go on to a university, could have a career because they haven't seen examples of that. They, they think that if I spend money on my son's education, that's going to come back to our family. That's an investment in our family. Our daughter is going to leave our home We'll have to pay money for her dowry and then she is going to be a wife and a mother somewhere else and and there's no benefit to her education so in order to correct that in order to have the the parents especially see the potential in their daughter and to imagine a different future it takes a lot of time there's not an easy fix to it uh it's a lot of relationship building it's not just uh you know the the family night at school a couple times a year it really has to come through building relationships with the parents going to homes uh taking time to have discussions and really listening listening to what what are their concerns what are their expectations for their daughters um and listen listening before speaking um and for for us to achieve this gender equality, for us to get the girls past 12th standard, this is key. It has to happen. You know, changing the adult mindset, getting them onto the same page um, is the biggest challenge. Oh, Sunita, you're on mute. <laughs> Thanks, Rose. I mean, I think I echo a lot of things that you have uh, mentioned and uh, you know, even in Breakthrough, where we have worked in Jharkhand and Bihar, it's very similar issues of early marriage uh, and uh, people not investing in education because they feel that if you educate a girl child, then you would need a higher educated boy, for which means, you know, higher dowry and that entire vicious cycle of pushing them back into poverty. I mean, it's, it's really scary. Um, so uh, and also everyone knows that if you invest in education and if the girls are able to complete secondary education at least if not more um, you are able to significantly reduce um, age of you know uh, early marriage and increase the age of marriage um so yeah let's hear from nita if you can uh, add in your perspective you know rose you were talking about rural jharkhand but this sounded like the story of my own life um i mean despite the fact that I came from a family that lives in the city, always has lived in the city. The attitudes, uh, even in my uh, family home, were very similar. Uh, that, you know, um, I was literally being groomed. Whatever was invested in me was not towards my intellectual growth. It was my value as a bride, as a wife, future wife. And uh, I was a victim of the same patriarchal structure where, you know, my brother was sent abroad to study. I was the one who was the academic one, but I was denied the opportunity to even continue with further studies in India. It was like, no, 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 you can't do this because 
we, you know, uh, if you get married to someone who's less qualified than you, that will cause issues. So this was something I faced all my life. And, um, and you know, it, it's so, and, and, and I got married into a family finally that was, ostensibly very very educated my mother-in-law you know they were very sophisticated people um, but that patriarchal mindset was still there i mean even today i sometimes have these like moments where i'm talking to my mother-in-law and saying Can you hear yourself amma what are you even saying but um uh, you know you've all spoken greatly about the uh, mindset of the adults and that is reflected so often even in the texts that we use in school. So for instance, this was something that I had a big problem with that, you know, uh, especially, I'm sorry, uh, but in our Hindi books, especially, I, I used to tell our Hindi teachers, please, please be very careful about what you're reading to the children. There were, you know, question papers that were sometimes set, which had uh, excerpts from books that were talking about working women as being fast and loose and, you know, uh, not having enough time for their children, uh, and and these were given to children, uh, given to students to uh, use as texts. The mother was always portrayed as this woman who got up early in the morning, did puja, served the whole house. So this was just reinforcing things. So um, I think that's also a big challenge. That you know, are we really looking at what we are feeding our kids? There are so many subliminal messages that are going to children that tell them that you know girls are different and they they need to be treated differently and yes of course in some ways we are different yes i accept that that maybe but but why is it always being portrayed as something that you know because you're different inferior and and girls is one thing now the uh, you know now the conversations have to grow beyond just girls and boys we have to talk about all kinds of people and identities. So I'm going to let the others talk because I know that I don't want to hog the space. Sure. Thanks, Nita. I mean, uh, I think it takes a lot of courage to share from a personal experience. Uh, so thank you for doing that. Um, and and it, it also kind of brought forth the point very strongly that education does not necessarily mean empowerment. And therefore, what is the role of education? Is it just, you know, knowing your maths, English, science, <laughs> Hindi, or is it also beyond that? Is it really empowering people, young people to take agency of their lives? Um, so uh, Deepak, I'd like to hear from you uh, because, you know, you worked with Raising Voices, you've led that organization, you've worked with over a thousand schools. Um, are the challenges similar in Uganda and other places that you have worked or is it different? No, it, in, in some ways, I think that listening to Nita and even Rose, it's depressing to see that patriarchy lives everywhere uh, and, and it manifests in many of the similar ways. So many of the girls uh, are the secondary consideration in a family when they're making decisions around who gets to go to school. Now, in, in Uganda, we, are, we have a couple of slightly different things going on. Mm. Uganda is a much smaller country than, than in India. Mm. And so the policies like universal education uh, uh, have in some ways hit the ground where significant proportion of girls have had access to schools. Uh, for what tends to happen, though, is that the expectations from girls are much, much higher in terms of they will mm -hmm. contribute labor at work and that if the family is in, in difficult circumstances, the girl is the first person to be pulled out of school. And then right. even when in school, there are a whole lot of systems that are in some ways discriminating against the girl from being able to learn and benefit from the systems at school. So, so in a way, what I wanted to talk about is what Rose and what Nita are talking about as well that how do we start conversations with parents? Yeah, that mo a lot of the time, parents are not bad people. Yeah, they, they want good things for their children. Mm -hmm. But somehow the patriarchal system has put some values in front of them by which then they start making decisions. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And so that's the thing that we started doing uh, through the program called Good School Toolkit in, uh, in, in that, we started having conversations with adults at schools 
and then through schools, conversations with parents. And the idea was that it's not you are a bad person for thinking this or being this, but helping people understand that the systems around you is leading you to value girls, think of girls in a different way compared to boys. Right. And we've had a little bit of success with that in the mm -hmm. sense that parents are getting curious, parents are coming to school, mm -hmm. and children at school are exploring those ideas and taking them home with parents. Mm -hmm. So the, in some ways, the contribution that I wanted to make in this part of the conversation is that how do we start that conversation? Because if we do it from a place of judging people, mm. then, then in some ways people will retreat to their camps. Right. But if we open the channel of conversation that, hey, there is a win-win situation here, that if you invest in girls, there are a lot of benefits, like both uh, Rose and Nita were talking about, right? The pair of, and, and, and you said too, Sunita, that mm. if we invest in girls, there is a whole lot of benefits that the entire community gets from right. doing that and then moving that forward. Right. So um, I think that, you know, uh, in some ways, the problems and, and, and the, the, the problem that we are facing is very similar hmm. uh, in terms of how to make sure that girls get as much out of the education and as hmm. a system as right. boys do as well. Yeah. Right. And then that's where I think systemic solutions that we're talking about are really important is that why should we think of this as a systemic problem rather than something that we have to do with individual parents in terms right. of changing their mind and changing their mindset right i mean since uh, deepak you've already touched upon the good school um, you know initiative that you had done with over a thousand schools it'll be um, good to hear how as a best practice it has emerged i mean what have been some of the success Full indicators and and then we can hear from others on the different initiatives that people have taken and we can see from like three different lenses so one can be from a school school level lens i mean yuva has been doing um you know um, and then we can look uh from a global lens which you you can bring in the puck and from the government lens we can hear from rajpalji so uh, if you can just brief a little more on the good schools thing and then we can go to rose so the problem that we started engaging schools with, our, our, our intention at Racing Forces is to prevent violence against women and children. And we wanted to prevent violence against children at schools. And essentially in Uganda, that uh, the bigger problem is adult to child violence rather than child to child. Child to child violence is still there, peer violence, bullying, that is still there and is significant but adult to child violence is significant as well. And that's the problem we were addressing ourselves with, that how to prevent corporal punishment. Mm -hmm. And when we started working, what we saw most people were doing, are were doing targeted interventions at schools towards teachers. So mm -hmm. training teachers, building teachers capacity, or mm -hmm. building capacity of students to resist violence. And for about 10, 12, 15 years, we, we were seeing that even if the law was in place, the violence was continuing unmitigated, meaning that it just, there was no dent in, 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 in the prevalence levels. Right. We asked ourselves the fundamental question that what needs to change? What, how do we need to approach this problem different? And that's when we formulated the idea that the system of the school needs to change, that this problem lives in the system and mm. individuals are just perpetuated in the system rather than it living in individuals and we have to address it. So okay. we started off with what are teachers being taught at teachers training colleges? What hmm. policies are being put in place? What in-service support is there for teachers? How is the school formulating the objective of school? How is the school op offering opportunities to children to participate in day-to-day -day running of school? How are yeah. children perceiving the role of school in their lives? How are children experiencing school on a day-to-day -day basis? How much power do children have how many opportunities do children have to contribute their ideas? What happens in the classroom when they have a question? Are they allowed to be formulating their ideas? Is creativity something that is encouraged or not? Those are the kinds of outcomes we started looking at rather than the incidence of corporal punishment from teacher to student. And we developed a six step system intervention, which is starting from ask, helping school ask what they wanted to do and who will be the actors and then helping mm -hmm. them, the entire school 
with participation of teachers and students, creating a different kind of school. And that's what we call a good school toolkit. And that's what's being used in 1,000 schools in Uganda, and it's actually spreading further and further. Right. And it has been evaluated through a randomized trial, and it has traveled to other places as well. Right. I'll stop there. I must say that Breakthrough has been inspired by the Good School Initiative as well, and we've taken a lot of learnings from you. So thank you, Deepak, for uh, bringing that initiative. And I think it's a holistic system. Uh, and uh, uh, our, our uh, folks here, I mean, and you've seen from like an individual incident school level to how do you kind of make it a systemic issue at, at you know, in large scale and how do you kind of take on the principles uh, from there and make sure that it can be done at a structural level and at an institutional level, at a community level, and how do you bring it all together? So it's a very interesting um, model. Uh, I'd just like to hear from a policy perspective, um, uh, Rajpalji, because uh, you come from a government uh, lens. Um, so when we're seeing ki, uh, for the education system, ko kis tarike se hum systems level change ke kaise lekar aayen? So if you can tell us about that, that will be useful. So basically talking about uh, how do you make a systems level change in the education system from a gender and education intersection? Where did the change in the system? The question is, my own thought is that in Haryana, we have child safeguarding committees for children for children. और उनमें काउंसलर्स भी काफी नंबर ऑफ स्कूल्स में हमने अपॉइंट कर दिए जो बच्चों को भी और एक इसी के उसमें एक बालिका मंच नाम से हमने एक कमेटी का उसको नाम दिया है जो एवरी सैटरडे अपने स्टूडेंट्स के साथ वो चाहे गर्ल है या चाइल्ड है परंतु अलग-अलग करते हैं अभी उनकी समस्याओं को जानते हैं और उनका फिर समाधान करते हैं ये एक बहुत बड़ा एक प्रकार से गुड स्कूलिंग की ओर हमारा एक प्रयास है ए, साथ ही जो बच्चों को या गर्ल्स को स्कूल में आने के लिए जो दिक्कत होती है कि फार जो स्कूल से दूर के जगह है जहां पर सेकेंडरी एजुकेशन के लिए या सीनियर सेकेंडरी लेवल के एजुकेशन के लिए लड़कियों को स्पेशली आना पड़ता था उनके लिए ट्रांसपोर्टेशन का प्रोविजन जो है ये हरियाणा सरकार ने किया है और मेरा ये मानना है कि ये एक बड़ा ही अच्छा कदम है कि जो बच्ची हमारी ड्रॉप आउट होती थी या पेरेंट्स को कहीं पर एप्रिहेंशन होता था कि भई है ना मेरी बच्ची रास्ते में सेफ नहीं है तो उसके लिए स्टेट ने ट्रांसपोर्टेशन हर गर्ल स्टूडेंट्स को प्रोवाइड कराया है उसके लिए फाइनेंस किया जाता है पैसा दिया जाता है बच्चे को और 4 5 6 का एक ग्रुप बनता है जो एक टैक्सी हायर करते हैं डेली वो स्कूल आते हैं और स्कूल से वापस घर पे जाते हैं ए, जहां तक कुछ अलग समस्याएं होती हैं गर्ल्स की तो हमने हर स्कूल में हर बच्चे को पूरा ईयर के लिए सैनिटरी नैपकिन सम प्रोवाइड करा दी हरियाणा गवर्नमेंट ए इंसिनेटर्स अलग से वहां लगाए हैं कि वो है ना आफ्टर यूज यदि कहीं वो करना है तो हर स्कूलों के अंदर हमने प्रोवाइड करा दिया है तो इस प्रकार से यदि हम बात करें के टॉयलेट्स वगैरह की जो एक प्रकार से गवर्नमेंट स्कूल्स के लिए बड़ा इश्यू होता था हरियाणा का एक भी स्कूल ऐसा नहीं है और मेरे जिला करनाल में मैं 780 स्कूल देखता हूं गवर्नमेंट स्कूल हां यस आपका इशू आ रहा है कोई थोड़ा वॉइस में इशू आ रहा है मैं थोड़ा जल्दी से ट्रांसलेट कर लेती हूं थैंक्स प्रथा फॉर पुटिंग द ट्रांसलेशंस ऑन द साइड but very quickly, uh, Rajpal ji spoke about on how child safeguarding has been a priority for them and they have appointed counselors in every school. Uh, they've also set up an initiative called Balika Manch, uh, which uh, addresses issues uh, uh, which girls are facing and tries to resolve them. Uh, mobility is a big challenge in Haryana and especially around safety and security of girls when they go uh, back and forth from home to school. And for that, Haryana government has made an initiative where um, they kind of uh, ensure that people can take taxis uh, in groups to their schools. And uh, this is compensated by the Haryana government. 
Uh, and this has actually uh, helped in um, uh, reducing dropouts and ensuring safety and security of girls. So these are initiatives that they have uh, done. Also around menstrual hygiene, um, they have ensured that sanitary napkins are available for uh, girls. And there are incinerators um, available in, in schools so for safe disposal of the sanitary pads. These are great initiatives. Um, thank you, Rajpalji. I think uh, government- uh, 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 Sunita ji, uh, Sunita ji, I want to say one thing. The state government, the Haryana state एक इनिशिएटिव ली है कि पहले हमारे यहां गर्ल्स स्कूल अलग होते थे और बॉय स्कूल्स अलग होते थे अब हमने ये डिसाइड किया है गवर्नमेंट ऑफ हरियाणा ने कि हम सेपरेट गर्ल्स स्कूल नहीं करेंगे जो भी नया स्कूल बनेगा वो सब कोएड स्कूल ही होगा ये भी इनिशिएटिव एक मेरा मानना है कि बहुत अच्छा इनिशिएटिव बहुत बढ़िया सो so, uh, uh, as part of the policy initiative haryana government has decided that they will no longer create girls only boys only um, schools but all new schools uh, which will be inaugurated will be co-ed schools where girls and boys get to uh, interact with each other in a healthy uh, and positive way uh, so very interesting i mean it's it's interesting to hear from a government lens from uh, you know where where civil society organization is working at scale uh, at a systems level um, uh, from all your experience because you've worked you know in schools you've set up school systems uh you've directly worked with uh children any any learnings from uh your own experience which you think can contribute to uh at a systems level um nita may i take this yes please so um one of the things that i I feel that at a systems level, we really need to uh, educate everyone around children is the language that is used because language is so, so powerful. And, um, you know, just the kind of messages that we are sending out to children when, uh, for instance, uh, just the other day I was at a school where you know, children were playing and immediately when it was the girls who were doing something that were that mm. looked slightly risky or or, you know, uh, da dangerous in the children's context, like there was so mm. much attention. No, 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 don't do that. You'll you'll get hurt. Whereas if a boy was doing the same thing, no one really mm. uh, bothered. You know, it was like boys will scrape knees and uh, break bones. But girls shouldn't so just yeah. that kind of language you know just making it normal for everybody to similar to what lee was saying you know making it normal for everybody to do to scrape knees and uh, break bones um also even you know the moment uh like at school i remember when girls used to come dressed up for their birthdays uh, very often the teachers would say oh you're looking so pretty you know, just this, that this is your role to look pretty. And and no one would compliment the boys when they were dressed as much. You know, it, it was all these things that I think, I think we really need to be very conscious of the messages we're sending out. And one of the ways that we did that at our school was using stories as a very powerful medium. Mm -hmm. uh, we would read all kinds of stories. We would pick up stories that were where where girls were the heroes and you know things like that but when there were stories that put women in these very stereotypical roles we would have discussions about this that hey do you think this is okay do you think that this is only the job of women or shouldn't shouldn't the boys be helping out as well like why is this story do you want the world to be this way and yeah. um I was at that time at uh, you know in primary school and we would we would talk about this right from a very early age that you need to we need to question what we are being fed we would yeah. rewrite uh, fairy tales and change the endings for the princesses and you know say but why should the princess have to marry the prince at the end of every story why can't the princess maybe start a business of uh, her own and lead an independent life yeah. why is sleeping beauty waiting for a prince to come and rescue her why can't she do something herself so we would we would question all these things and i think these led to a lot of uh, very interesting discussions and kids would really 
uh, even go home and talk about these things and uh, yeah. that that was one way and from the uh, you know when sir uh, was talking uh, rajpal ji was talking i was also thinking that in the government school system there's such an opportunity to have these kind of discussions and forums with you know there are these smcs that are meant to be part of every government school right maybe having discussions with them around these topics and actually uh bringing up these points that you know what is the language that you're using at home is it shouldn't we all agree that we should use similar language and not make girls feel different uh yeah. or inferior in these ways so right thanks Nita. um i think uh, uh yeah we really need to change the gender norms around it it's not just enough to kind of you know do some one policy one law you bring out it really may not make a difference unless and until you really address the gender norms around the whole uh, aspect and right from the curriculum on how it is written the images that are shown in the thing the text which is there to teachers own mindsets because they're also coming from the same environment as you know everyone else is and they also have received the same messages and just being educated does not lead to that empowered lens I think so one really needs to start from there and I think bringing this critical analysis um, piece in where people where, where you've done it with students where you know children can analyze fairy tales starting from there and rewrite so I mean how do you bring that lens where students are in young people and learners are able to identify uh, that across I think that will be an interesting thing um Rose if we can hear from you any experience from your uh, level on what yeah. you would if given an opportunity what is the recommendation that you would give for uh yeah. scaling for system absolutely <clears throat> so listening to Nita talk I, I think uh another very important factor in terms of of achieving gender equality and empowering our girls is making sure that we invest in female leadership and invest in, in our girls' leadership development so that the youngest girls have female role models. That's yeah. so important. Um, you know, just an example from our organization, we have uh, we have a football program that works very closely with our school. And we have more than 30 young female coaches who then lead more than 600 girls. And almost all of the coaches are enrolled in our school as well, and they're able to take the lessons that they learn in school, you know, not just academic lessons, but but life lesson, life skill lesson, you know, the confidence that they gain, the uh, the ambition that they gain, their their future goals, they're able to take all of that and then share it with these younger girls. And that is so powerful for these young girls to look up and think, well, look at what my Didi is doing. You know, if my Didi is just like me, you know, her home is just like mine and look what she's doing. You know, she's studying, she's in 11th standard, she's traveling, she's coaching a boys game, you know, what's supposed to be a boys game. That is so powerful because then that little girl can imagine herself doing it. And then uh, to take that one step further, it's also critical to go back to the uh, the discussion about the adult mindset to raise up those role models and show show the parents examples, concrete examples of what can happen when you invest in your daughter's education. So at our school, we've only had four graduating classes, but we've seen incredible success. We have graduates at at Ashoka University, Korea University, you know, other other renowned universities in India, and we even have one at Harvard. And so what we've done is uh, made posters of the graduates, their photos from childhood to, you know, young adulthood, highlighted their stories, and we printed them and put them up around the school. And so that's, that's powerful, not just for the young girls, but for their families when they come in. And we're able to, you know, point to this poster of a graduate and say, look at this girl, you know, she's just like your daughter and look what she's been able to accomplish yeah. um so and there's more than one way to invest in female leadership of course having a meaningful student council in your school is a great way to get students to uh to to rise to their their leadership potential to to plan yeah. events to to look at their school as their own and think how can i make this better um uh, the school management committees as well, although yeah you can have students on, on school management committees 
but there there are so many different ways that you can uh you can elevate students and help them to grow into their their own leadership potential you could have a library committee uh you know there, there's there's so many different ways to do this clubs yeah. as well thanks rose i think yeah um, um it's really critical that we involve young people into the decision making at every level so mm. not just in their own lives or within the classroom but also in the running of the school or the through the students council or the smcs and once you have you know because adolescents in india or across the world i think uh, they either treated as children or they treated as adults too early ready for you know uh, marriage and labor and <laughs> that kind of so recognizing adolescents for their own uh, Selves, I think that's that's not there. And if we are able to provide that identity and add that voice to young people, so that they can negotiate within the school system, within their families, have a have an identity within their communities where they are contributing members, I think that'll be really really fabulous. Um, you spoke about role modeling, Rose. I think, and that's that's uh, that's a really powerful thing because in every school, every community, there are some folks who are who have broken all kinds of gender challenges and have established themselves despite of all the hurdles and providing them with that um you know highlighting those positive deviant stories in media through posters mm -hmm. i think that really helps because people do look forward to it and uh, usually people think oh you know uh, maybe i need to get my child married because everyone else thinks that's a desirable thing to do but actually it is not when you hear positive stories you realize yeah you know maybe i need to get her educated maybe i need to um you know uh, let her pursue further education um to the best institutes possible and when people hear that they think yeah that that's the way to be um uh, so yeah lee uh, uh i'd love to hear from you okay so i've been listening with fascination to everything that's been said in my school, I had the privilege of not just being an English and social studies teacher, mm -hmm. but I was also the volleyball coach, the, mm -hmm. the editor of the school magazine. Yeah. Uh, I coordinated all inter school and inter house events. Mm -hmm. So I had this really unique position where I could put my ideas into practice. So if we had, uh, I worked with the student council. Mm -hmm. uh on a regular basis so we would have uh and they would literally plan every event i would tell them okay the, first of all we need to have the calendar for the school what are the events you want to have then yeah. we sit down and decide what are going to be the norms of the event and who's going to run it and i would say okay mm -hmm. now i'm going to sit back and enjoy the event and you guys are taking over and if there's an issue you need to sort it out don't come crying to me so they would think through everything and I'm pretty good at sitting back and letting them figure it out. So they used to run every program yeah. that we had. And we'd, uh, uh, you know, to have programs in, uh, they, uh, we'd uh, uh, look at uh, inter-house discipline, sports, cultural activities, and they had to run that. So, and we had boys and girls who held the same position. So there would be a cultural captain for, for the boys and a cultural captain for the girls. Mm. Uh, Inter-school events, I would choose uh, uh, con a contingent leader based on merit. So there mm. have been years where all my girls, because we have very few girls in comparison with boys, so all my girls would be participating and I might have a contingent leader who's a boy or two boys. Sometimes mm. it would be just two girls or one, you know, it, but they would get to make those decisions even in uh, putting together the school magazine uh, my editorial team consisted of largely my students who right. would make decisions and so those learnings empower them to go ahead and do stuff that mm -hmm. they wanted to do because they believed that they could do it and they always had these uh, you know disasters as well as triumphs to look back on and learn from mm -hmm. and so um, I want to share a story of a child who was in my class and we were reading The Merchant of Venice yeah. and we were at this point where uh, Portia, the heroine, who's supposed to be this great, very, you know, brilliant heiress, finally uh, has Basanya choose the right casket and she immediately starts to talk about herself as unschooled, unlearned, unloved. 
And for me, that was a moment when one of my students looked at me, mouthed an expletive saying, what? And was so, so angry because she saw that in a book. Yeah. So that was an aha moment. And she stood up as soon as we finished reading that. And she was so mad and she ranted and raved in class. And my boys agreed with her. And yeah. they were like, yes, because they were looking at the son who has this useless guy who has no money. Who no, has no money. Okay, and who's literally begging for money to go and propose to somebody else and choose the casting. So it's right. moments like these where you have worked with and provided that space for students to think on their own, to say what they think without fear. And that's where you start. And it has to be sustained. It can't be, you know, just a one-off thing. So my students could stand up and tell me, okay, I disagree with you, or I don't agree with what you're doing, or I'm mad at you, irrespective of gender. And my girls would do it as frequently, sometimes more than the boys, when, because they were more verbal in what they would say. Yeah. And you have to provide those spaces. You have to provide those opportunities for a child to come and tell you, no, I don't think that this is the right way to do this. I think this is a better way to do it. And yeah. everybody sits down and listens, irrespective of gender. So those kind of initiatives where you're providing that space through your regular school programs are a great starting point. Yeah. How do you normalize it? I think that's the entire uh, piece. Uh, we have Alicia um, Shepard, who's written that perhaps investing in healthy male role models uh, programs is important. Changing the existing mindset of our boys may actually produce as much impact. Uh, and uh, I agree with you, Alicia. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't say more important or less important, but it's important to work with boys as well as uh, um, people with all their gender uh, diversities. Uh, and uh, from our experience, um, we uh, breakthrough runs this gender equity program in schools in Haryana. We had tried and tested a um, you know, Tarungi Toli program, uh, which ran in 150 schools with some 18,000 students. And the result of it was, um, it was done with both boys and girls that um, boys behavior shifted more significantly than the girls around, um, uh, around aspirations and further education for girls. Uh, and it was interesting because uh, there was a lot more social constraints for girls. So when boys also undergo the same uh, curriculum, they're able to kind of assert themselves because the society gives them that power. So um, uh, so that was a very interesting study which Jpal had done on our uh, work. It also kind of brought out huge amount of uh, impact in terms of attitudes and behaviors of uh, young girls and uh, uh, boys around uh, paid employment and higher education not just right after the program, but five years down the line also, and now eight years down the line also, there's still a 16% positive shift uh, on the program impact. Uh, so much so that we're thinking of tracking the same set of students who had been through the program for two years, um, you know, in the next four years to see, you know, once they've grown up and uh, they're, you know, taking decisions around career, marriage, reproductive choices, does a gender equity program, a two-year program, have a lifelong kind of uh, impact? So, um, yeah, so it's really critical uh, on in making it more inclusive. Gender equity is not only for girls, it's for everyone, and everyone gets affected by it. Um, we are also working with Odisha government, and it was, it was very, very uh, positive that Odisha government said that we don't want to look at a program in binaries. We want it to be inclusive and we need to look at, you know, at the entire uh, gamut of identities. And that is really, really positive coming from our state government. So there we are. <laughs> Things are changing slowly, but steadily. It takes time. We've been at it for decades, but I guess it's, it's heartening to see some of the changes which happen. So uh, talking about evidence um it'll be really interesting to hear uh, some of the evidence uh, that has come across um, um i'd like to hear from you deepak i mean you've done like an extensive randomized control trial on the you know good school uh, toolkit how it has made an impact uh, it'll be good to hear from your lens on what has worked what has the evidence been have you seen similar models across the world yeah yeah no i 
maybe if I can just take one minute to kind of agree with all the speakers that uh, that have gone before me in the sense that I think that uh, what Nita was saying, what Rose is saying, what Lee is saying, and what you're saying is that dismantling what we have all inherited, which is the patriarchal way of being in this world, is a difficult thing because it's a very complicated. It has permeated deep into our lives, right? So it's a multi-layered thing that we have to do. It's not just one thing. It's all the things that people have talked about. It's what children see at school, what children hear at school, and it's what they get to do at school, yeah, which is what Lee is talking about as well, that making decisions and being part of the power and things like that. And those kinds of things are hard to do and show in terms of studies. It's hard to conduct a study that tracks multiple things that kids get to do, the sum total of its effect being what we're looking for. But what, let me just state a couple of things that like we have done um, a randomized trial around if you try to change things at a systems level, is it effective way of uh, changing children's experience of school? And in our case, what we meant by that is they experience less violence, they, exper they experience more participation, they are able to exercise their power a little bit more. What we found, uh, based on the intervention that we did, is that if you, change the systems of schools, you can reduce the violence against children by 42% from adult to children, yeah? In the space of just 18 months, which in some sense is long, but on the other hand, given the how long we've had patriarchy around for, it's not that long. So it's doable, yeah? We found similar thing at a community level as well around violence against women, that if you have a systemic intervention, very much along the lines of what I was talking about schools, at a community level, at a family level, you can reduce violence against women by 50%. Yeah? And the central idea there being that we are changing the way the community perceives and thinks about women and children, rather than putting all the emphasis and responsibility of bringing about a change on women and on girls, right? Because that is a hard thing to do. We've been trying that for a long period of time. We need to change the container rather than people who are in the container. Yeah. But having said that, uh, you know, ch girls, for example, mm, uh, there's a lot of evidence that investing in a girl has pays huge dividends. Yeah. From each extra year that a girl stays in school, there's substantial gain in the family's income over a lifetime of a girl. Each extra year that a girl stays in school, there is implications for how her children will do how her health will, uh, will, uh, will unfold as she grows into, into middle age and things like that. There's huge consequences for mental health of girls and, 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 and of the entire family around each, uh, each extra year a girl, a girl stays in school, there's huge implications around her own mental health and then her family's mental health. So in some ways the evidence is so overwhelming for this thing, yeah, that it's a no-brainer in terms of what, what we need to do. And so what I would say is that, you know, at least what I have been focusing on is that there's a lot of evidence. And so we have produced a lot of evidence. Now we need to focus a little bit on how do we do it? Yeah, uh, how do we go about it? And, and all the ideas that people were talking about from what Rose was saying and then what Lee was saying, yeah, uh, are really important that we identify tactics, we identify interventions that contribute to this enterprise of dismantling the experience that is so patriarchal in schools. Those are some of the things that I would put to the group in terms of focus. Oh, thanks, Deepak. I mean, you're right. I mean, there is overwhelming evidence around why it is important for girls to, uh, you know, complete education, be a part of the education system, and what are the long-term gains? I think it will bring us much, much closer to all the SDG goals uh, if, uh, you know, we address the intersection of gender and education, and if girls are able to complete their education. And I think you also highlighted on how it is important to work at multiple levels and not just, you know, with the girls and the students or learners per se, but you know, from from a schooling system to, you know, engaging families and communities to engaging the larger government system. So really looking at it from a socio-ecological model and saying, you know, you need to work at every level from the 
student, family, institution, policy, you know, larger uh, societal level. And, and it's only when you do that and you kind of travel that entire curve that we are able to do that. And of course, I mean, it's, it's not possible for any organization to do it at an individual level. And that's where partnerships come on how do you kind of learn from each other and uh, you know carry your best practices forward and be a part of the coalition um, um deepak you also lead a coalition so it'll be interesting to hear on the ideas of you know how you're bringing these kind of things into the coalition space so the coalition that i am uh, working with is called coalition for good schools and it was founded by leaders from uh, or the people who are running organizations in the global south around influencing children's experience of school so they are from all over the place so from philippines to india to africa or um, several countries in africa to latin america and the unifying idea there is that how can we share experiences how can we build each other's capacity how can we enhance each other's voice in mm -hmm. terms of influencing how children experience school Mm -hmm. And so our intention is to bring as many voices from global south as possible to the table because mm -hmm. majority of children live in the global south. Yeah. And therefore, people who are doing things like Lee and Nika and Rose and others in the global south have something really profound to contribute to what kind of policies we develop at a global level, what kind of interventions we line up behind, what kind of evidence do we demand from researchers that we need that on the table to be able to do this work. But the central idea being that we need to come together and amplify our voices collectively mm. on a day-to-day -day experience. A lot of the time policy is made elsewhere where resources are coming from. And what yeah. we're saying is that the experience on the ground matters. Yeah, mm. because that's when we are most likely to find efficient pathways to solutions. True, true. Thanks so much, uh, Deepak, for sharing it. And uh, I mean, all the people listening would highly encourage you to kind of visit the website of Coalition of Good Schools and see if you know you yourselves or your organizations would want to be a part of this coalition because that's where you know these kind of discussions that we're doing right now. I mean, how how we are able to kind of do it at a larger level and bring our voices out in the open and make sure that there's enough evidence and policy around it. So you're welcome to, um, I, Deepak, if you can quickly put the website on the chat, I think people can access it uh, easily. Um, uh, Rajpalji, I think, uh, dropped off. But in the meantime, it'll be good to hear if there are any questions, any comments um, that people would want to ask um, from the panelists, if, if there are any comments that you would want to make. We can spend a, you know, we can spend some time. Thanks, Tisha. Um, uh, any freedom. questions people can raise? The user is available. Uh, okay, Achha, I couldn't see him. So, uh, huh. so um, 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 uh, Rajpalji, it will be good to hear from a uh, systems lens. Because you have many people who come from different programs. Uh, education ko leke, gender ko leke. but systems level pe aisi kya cheeze hain jo hame dhyan rakhni chahiye which can work at scale to agar uske bare mein thoda batayenge that will be useful sunita ji mera manna hai ke problem solving approach ke sath yadi hum chalenge to hum jitna bhi problems aa rahi hai unko hum sabko tackle kar sakte hain aur unka solution hum de pate hain ha तो हमें अपने पॉजिटिव सोच के साथ के जो भी बच्चा पैदा हुआ है वो उसको एक ऐसा एटमॉस्फेयर हम प्रोवाइड करा पाए जिससे उसकी जो स्कूली एजुकेशन है उसमें किसी प्रकार का भेदभाव ना हो उसके लिए हमें प्रयासरत रहना चाहिए और अपना माइंड बिल्कुल क्लियर रखना चाहिए तो यदि प्रॉब्लम सॉल्विंग अप्रोच के साथ काम करेंगे पॉजिटिव माइंडसेट के साथ काम करेंगे तो निश्चित तौर पे हम बिल्कुल अच्छे से अपना काम कर सकते हैं अवेयरनेस ऑफ पेरेंट्स एक बहुत बड़ा चैलेंज है हमारे लिए उस पे ब्रेक थ्रू हमारे साथ काम कर रहा है विलेज लेवल पे हमने कमेटीज फॉर्मुलेट करी है ब्रेक थ्रू के माध्यम से 
एसएमसीज को और स्ट्रेंथन करने का स्टेट इनिशिएटिव से अलग भी एसएमसीज के लिए ब्रेक थ्रू की जो टीम है वो एसएमसीज को अवेयर कर रही है कि एजुकेशन कितनी जरूरी है और एजुकेशन के जो पैरामीटर्स है उसमें एनहांस करने में या वो बच्चों तक वो सारा अच्छा मिल सके तो कैसे एसएमसी रोल प्ले कर सकती है ये बड़ा ही इम्पोर्टेंट एस्पेक्ट है मेरा तो ये मानना है कि ये यहीं तक ठीक है थैंक यू Thanks, Rajpal ji. So, uh, Rajpal ji spoke about um, on how if uh, you know people can come together, organizations, and come with a win-win partnership, uh, and with a problem-solving lens, uh, and if we have clear goal towards how do you make uh, you know education system gender equitable, then uh, we'll be able to make great strides in the same. Uh, he spoke about um, how they have collaborated with Breakthrough. Uh, uh, and have not just sensitized um, students around gender equity uh, program, but also created awareness for parents. They have formulated village committees um, and made sure that the communities are actively participating towards better uh, education and better intersection around gender and education. In fact, there was a uh, example from way before, uh, I mean, people were talking about, uh, he was talking about how Haryana government had made uh, a policy around co-ed schools and earlier when we used to work there was a co-ed school and they had created a physical wall um, so that the girls were separated and the boys were separated and it was after a long uh, initiative with the school with the students with the community members through the village committees uh, with the panchayat officials that the wall actually came down after they realized that it is okay for boys and girls to kind of study together, learn from each other. And once the wall came down, I think uh, it was not just a physical wall, but also a mental wall, which kind of uh, evaporated. And that's the power of how a win-win partnership between civil society organizations, between school systems, with the governments, with the policymakers, on if we kind of come together, we'll be able to make a change, not just at a government level but uh, or 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 or, or, or a one state level but across um, uh, yes nita it'll be you so just hand. very briefly um you know sunita we're also working with libraries in karnataka uh -huh. and um, uh, these are gram panchayat libraries which uh you know they uh they're meant to be uh, these, they used to be these spaces where people would come to study or read newspapers and things. And the Karnataka Panchayat Raj Department wants to actually transform these libraries into spaces that are active, welcoming spaces for children. Now, they may not be educational institutions, but the community also, you know, uh, can play such an important role in providing these spaces for girls and boys. And, and everyone actually, uh, equity for everyone, where people can come, they, they don't feel pressured because there's nothing to prove here. They can, and you know, in these libraries, apart from reading books, the librarians through the program are organizing activities, games, they're making these libraries really fun places for kids. And I was just thinking that apart from the schools and the home, there's so many other, uh, you know, things in the community that can work towards this goal. But one can activate the entire community in this manner. You spoke about reading spaces and, you know, developing this interest in uh, reading. And I think that's very powerful. Also, when I was hearing Rose and Lee, uh, when you were talking about volleyball and football, uh, you know, just using sports for breaking all those gender boundaries. How has that worked for you? It'll be really interesting to hear that aspect as well. Uh, well, for, for UA, we found that that having these teams of girls, uh, they, they almost always ask if they can have their practice every single day, and we usually limit it to five days a week. But what we've seen is that when they come together so often and play and work as a team, there, there can be so much, so much to be gained in that setting in terms of confidence, in terms of establishing a supportive community, and in terms of uh, creating a system of accountability, actually, you know, when they're 
for many of them going home and not being actively supported in their education, but if they're coming and having fun with their their teammates and their their positive coach every single day and 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 just getting this reinforcement that we're all working towards something together, we're having fun here, and then we're also going to school. Like it is, uh, it's very powerful, and that's why we've we've taken so much time to invest in in an active football program, an active sports program, because there is so much to be gained. There's also just the visibility of girls playing, and we have boys as well, I should mention. Uh, we do have about 10% boys who play in our program. Uh, we don't exclude them. We just say, if a new boy wants to join, he has to bring four new girls. And that's because we are you know, focused on girls empowerment as an organization. We don't want to exclude boys, but if we just said, everyone's welcome to come, you know, without any restrictions, it would become a boys program. That's just the reality. And so uh, we've just seen that there is, uh, there are so many benefits to, uh, to using sports as a platform. It's not, you know, it's a tool. It's not like a magic, something that's magic and is going to automatically be good. You know, it takes time, just like it takes time to make a school good uh, you have to to work to make a sports team or a sports program good and safe. Um, can we take uh, Rajpal? You say need to relook school syllabus through a gender lens. Absolutely. In fact, um, uh, Breakthrough has been receiving um, you know requests from a whole lot of state governments from Haryana, from Punjab, uh, from Odisha on how we can. You know, because it, curriculum is such a gendered space on how do we kind of relook at the education system, relook at the curriculum from a gender lens and see where the problems are and kind of, um, you know, give recommendations for uh, rewrite, not just fairy tales, but also textbooks in that sense. So, yeah, thanks, uh, sir, for uh, pointing that out. Uh, uh, do we have any questions, um, comments uh, for the panelists? Does anyone want to ask anything? Uh, Pritha, have I missed any uh, questions earlier? No, no Sunita. I... No. Okay. okay, okay. So uh, in that case, maybe we can take some um, closing remarks from everyone, like any last thoughts, any recommendations that you would want to make to, uh, um, you know, organizations, government, um, you know, other civil society players on, on this aspect. Um, we'll start with you, um, Lee. I would say let kids be themselves, let them grow up together, let yeah. them fight, sort things out themselves. Sports is critically important. And um, I had always a majority of boys and we used to have only a boys team for volleyball. And uh, then I had a delegation of girls who marched up to me one day and said, we also want to play. And I was like, so what's stopping you? Come and play. And then I would make it a rule that when they were practicing, they would, they, uh, depending on how many girls were there, they, were, uh, they would get to choose their teams and the captains would change every day to give everybody a chance to be captain. But they had to include girls and they had to have so many girls. And then the boys got really quick at identifying which girls could play well. And when my girls were captains, they would choose the players that they wanted. But uh, it is very important to have parental support as well, because as I started, I said the mindset of teachers and other adults is important. There would be uh, teachers who would tell to uh, parents that, you know, your, girl, your daughter's wasting time in sports, tell her to study, tell her that she shouldn't be playing with the boys and that kind of nonsense. But my girls did well in the end. My boys did too. I've had very few girls, but I've had two girls represent their state. And uh, so it's all, it's the work you do on the ground. And if you can get, buy, con get consensus on the ground with the adults dealing with all these children, whether it's sports or in the classroom or in writing programs, I think that is where you're going to make a difference. And before I close, uh, I work with another organization where I run writing workshops. And uh, there was talk about including families 
So we, uh, in, you know, whatever changes we want to bring and getting families and communities involved. So we have this unique uh, uh, program, which is called Family Literacy Night, where we pick a theme and have families coming together to write together and sharing on stuff that they, uh, you know, that's important to everybody. And that's one way of bringing change even within your family. So we just did one for teachers and students in Haiti, which is undergoing a lot of political turmoil. And we had the, uh, we had a family literacy night with about 50 students, teachers, educators from different parts of the world. But that's also a way of getting, you know, uh, community involved and trying to get mindsets to change so that way. Thanks, thanks Lee I think uh, it's a very powerful medium of promoting intergenerational dialogue because um, like in India at least there are no uh, though you say you know dining room conversations there's no dining room and there are no <laughs> conversations happening between parents and children at all so providing this kind of space um, structured space where people can talk about uh, you know these issues I think that can be a really powerful way um now nita uh, do you want to add some parting comments we have four minutes yeah, yeah just very briefly i think um one of the important things that we need to do mm -hmm. as educators as people responsible for children is to encourage questioning you know the questioning of everything and giving them that opportunity to say that you do not have to accept just because it has always happened in a particular way just creating that space and giving them that opportunity. Sure, thanks, Nita. Uh, Rose? Uh, sure. I think one thing that I wanted to mention uh, and that I'll leave here is, is just the importance of creating really strong safeguarding systems in schools as well. That's okay. essential. That has to be a you know foundational to uh, to everything we've been talking about. So you know, making sure that that's a top priority uh, for for you as a school or even as a system, if you're working on that level, making sure that there's very specific codes of conduct um, and that all the stakeholders, including the students, are aware of them. You know, I think that's a lesson that we've learned uh, and it's essential, you know, that there's uh, not just agreement about sort of the rules of behavior, but also uh, agreement about the norms and uh, an understanding that um, this is the way that we are going to treat other people. These are my rights, you know, as a member of this school, and that's that's really essential. Right. Thanks, Rose. Um, Deepak. I, I would like to say two things. First is that this girls not accessing education or dropping out of education or just not getting the opportunities they need to grow. Uh, we need to make that everyone's problem rather than just girls or the family's problem, right? And what that essentially that translates to is that we should make it a systemic problem rather than individual level problem. And then the second part of it is that we we are dismantling years and uh, hundreds of years of experience in terms of how girls should be valued and how girls should be, how women should be seen in, in our society. We're dismantling patriarchy. And dismantling patriarchy is very important in terms of ideas, experience, what you see, what you get to do. What we also have to be able to do in that process is not only just dismantle something, but remantle something different. Meaning that we have to build capacity of girls and others to be in a different way with each other. We're Lee's talking about what Nita was talking about, questioning everything, is contribution to this. That that was what then we are now in a very different way of being with each other. How can we build different kinds of relationships with each other? We have to role model those. We have to bring practical ideas. We have to bring practical opportunities for students and children to experience that. Those are the two things I would like to leave with the group. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, everyone. I think, um, 
yeah, clearly, if we want to work on the intersection of gender and education, we need to work at multiple, multiple levels. I mean, right from, like, you know, we really need to change the narrative, the existing narrative, which is there around this issue. And we need to work at a policy level, at a norm change level, at a systems level, structure level. And of course, people, whether it is students, teachers, school leaders, or parents, and or, or you know, policymakers, and bringing them all together and creating this, you know, increasing our many fold voices together and changing that narrative becomes really critical. Um, so um, thank you. Thank you so much. I think this has been an incredible discussion and we've had some clear pathways to what works on gender transformative education system on how do we need to kind of break barriers that, you know, gender transformation does not mean only working with girls. We need to make it bigger. The question and comments, um, you know, which we discussed, I think, uh, was was fa fantastic. I do hope that, you know, many years down the line, when we reflect back in 2030, we are able to see how our collective impactful work, whether it is through government, the coalition space, through individual organization space, on how we have contributed to the achievement of SDG 4 and 5. And we are able to eliminate this gender disparities and ensure equal access to education. So we are in it together and we're going to change the world in short. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you so much. Namaskar. Namaskar, everyone. Thank you. Oh, we've dot on time. Eventual. <laughs> thank you. Eileen, you wanted to show a video or something? Me? Closing. Yeah. No? Right before everybody leaves, we just wanted yeah. to share a few quick catalyst opportunities, which I will also share in the chat. Sure. And these are the catalyst awards. If you would like to nominate a person or an organization that's working within the field, mm -hmm. um, the link to that is in the chat. We also have catalyst markets. If you or an organization you know is working with crafts or something where you're selling aware of some sort. Mm -hmm. um, we would also like to share the Catalyst business commitment as well as the Social Change Innovators site, um, especially within education. If you have any, you know, best resources, best practices that you would like to share with fellow social entrepreneurs and people working within the area, that is available to you to upload and share. Yeah. And lastly, just big thank you to all of you for joining. Um, if you could unmute and say thank you, goodbye to our speakers as you leave, that would be much appreciated. Um, and big thank you to the speakers. It's been an incredibly interesting session. So thank you all for sharing your experiences with us. And we hope everyone has a wonderful day. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.